In the OUHK's Great Speakers series of lectures, Professor Lin Yi Fu spoke to a full house on the topic of demystifying the Chinese economy. Professor Lin was formerly Senior Vice President and Chief Economist of the World Bank. In the following talk, he describes some of the strategies China has adopted, which have led to the sustained rapid growth of its economy over a number of years. He also shares his thoughts on the future direction of the Chinese economy. I'm really delighted to have this opportunity to share with you some of my observations about the Chinese economy. And uh, because I like history, and I think that although most of you come here to understand the future of China, but history is connected. If we want to understand the futures, we need to understand now. And if we want to understand now, we need to understand the past. So in this one hour, I started my talk with a little bit reviews of what China have achieved since the reform and opening up in 1979. We know at that time, China was one of the poorest country in the world. Its per capita income was 182 US dollars, less than one third of the average in sub-Saharan African country, the poorest continent in the world. At that time, China was also a very inward-looking country. Its import and export was only 9.5% of China's GDP. That means more than 90% of production in China was not related to the war economy. But since 1979, things changed so fast because the average annual growth rate from 1979 to 2014 was 9.7% per year, the highest in the whole world, and lasted the longest in the human history. And China's trade grew at a rate of 16.3% per year over those 36 years period. And so with this very rapid growth and uh, opening up, by the time of 2009, China overtook Japan, became the second largest economy in the world. 2010, China's export overtook Germany to be the largest exporter in the world, with the so-called the factory of the world. And by the time of 2013, China's trade, that means import and export, overtook US to become the largest trading country in the world. And uh, last year, if we measure China's GDP by purchase power parity, China exceeded US to be the largest economy in the world. And uh, during this period of time, 680 million people got out of poverty and uh, made a very important contribution to the global fight for poverty. And I think that was one of the reasons why I became the chief economist of the World Bank, because the main mandate of the institution is to reduce poverty in the world. But if we took China out of the picture, the number of the poor people in the world actually did not decline. And the only reason that World Bank can claim we had a victory in the fight against poverty was because of China. But in spite of all those statistics, now people have a lot of concern about whether China can sustain its growth. Well, alternatively, many people worry that Chinese economy may collapse in the coming years. So in my short talk, I'd like to discuss, first, how come it was possible for China to grow so rapidly for such a long time? And certainly, the related question is, how come China could not grow that fast before 1979? 
Then you may say it because of economic reform, economic transition, but we know that in the 1980s, 1990s, all the socialist countries also had the economic reform, economic open up. Not all, not all the socialist countries, actually all the developing countries in 1980s, 1990s also implement some policy to reform, to open up their economy. But most of them collapse, stagnant, and uh, hit by crises from time to time. Unlike China, you know, stability and sustained growth. And then certainly everything has two sides. So I also like to mention about what kind of prices that China paid for its remarkable growth in the past 36 years. And finally, to the question you can send, will China maintain dynamic economic growth in the coming decades, especially in the 13 five years plan period? OK, the first question. How come China was able to achieve such a high growth rate? For this, we need to understand rapid economic growth is a modern phenomenon. Before 18th century, almost every country was stagnant. Even for the high-income countries in the 19th century, like those Western European countries, the historical data show before 18th century for them, the average annual growth rate of per capita income was 0.05% per year. That means what? It took 1,400 years for Western European countries to double their per capita income. But from 18th century to middle 19th century, all of a sudden, the growth rate jumped 20 times. The average annual growth rate of per capita income increased from 0.05% to 1% per year. The time it took to double per capita income reduced from 1,400 years down to 70 years. And then from the mid 19th century to now, the high income country in Western Europe or North America, their average annual growth rate further doubled from 1% per year up to now about 2% per year. And at the time required to double per capita income reduced from 70 years down to now about 35 years. Then what made this kind of dramatic changes possible? I think everyone here knows it was because of industrial revolution. With the industrial revolution, technological innovation accelerated. And not only the technological innovation, a new stream of higher value added industries appear continuously. And with this technological innovation, industrial grading, labor productivity improve, income increase. So that was the secret for this kind of modern rapid economic growth. For high income country, if they want to have a continuous economic growth, income growth, they need to have a continuous technological innovation, industrial grading. For a developing country, if they want to have a continuous increase in their income, they need to increase their productivity. Again, they need to have this technological innovation and industrial grading. But there's one thing different. Since the industrial revolution, all the high income countries, their technology, their industries are all on the global frontiers. So if they want to have technological innovation or industrial grading, they need to invent those kind of technology or industries. And we know that technological innovation, product innovations, require huge capital input and also very risky. As a result, as I mentioned, up to the mid-19th century, their average annual growth rate of per capita income is around 2% plus population growth rate, the average annual growth rate is about 2.53%. Quite stable for high income country. And for the developing country, as I mentioned, want to have a continuous increase in their per capita income, they need to raise 
develop productivity. They need to have a technological innovation in the gradient. However, developing country, their technology are old. Their industry value added is low, right? So their current situation is within global technology and an industrial frontier. So in the process of industrial upgrading and technological innovation, they have something called advantage of backwardness because they can borrow, they can imitate, they can license the technology from higher income country. And those kind of licensing, licensing or borrowing or imitation, the cost of innovation and industrial upgrading would be much lower than invent those kind of technology or industries. And the risk is also much smaller. So if a developing country knows how to tap into the potential of advantage of backwardness, they can grow much faster than the high income country. And uh, from the Second World War, there were certain economies tap into the potential, realize average annual growth rate of 7% or more continuously for 25 or more years. Certain economies knew the secret to use that. And China becomes one of those 13 up to 1979. So my answer to the first question actually is very simple. The ability to utilize the advantage of backwardness. But if the advantage of backwardness was the reason for the rapid economic growth up to 1979, those kind of advantage has been there for a century before 1979, right? And how come before 1979, Chinese economy stagnant? And China was so poor. And my answer is actually is quite simple, because China gave up voluntarily to use that advantage of big ones. Because we know that socialist government took over in 1949, and starting in the 1950s, China wanted to modernize the nation. But at that time, the idea of modernization was to catch up US in 15 years, and to overtake Britain in 10 years. So that means what? China wanted to develop the most advanced modern industry immediately in the 1950s. But those kind of modern industries still under the patent protection of the high-income country, right? They just invent that. And not only so, most of those industries related to the national security, defense. So under the kind of situation, the high-income country would not transfer those kind of technology. And if you want to develop those kind of industry, you needed to reinvent the wheel. So voluntarily give up the potential of advantage of back one. Not only so, those kind of industries were very capital intensive, require a lot of capital input. But China in 1950 was a poor agrarian countries. Capital was not the advantage of China, right? China had abundant supply of labor force, but you cannot ask abundant supply of labor force to create a modern industry, right? So as a result, in an open competitive market, those kind of industry were not consistent with China's competitive advantages. Firm in those kind of sectors were not viable in an open competitive markets. So unless the government protect them, subsidize them, mobilize resources to invest in those kind of sectors, it was impossible to establish those kind of sectors. They require subsidy and protections. And how can you subsidize them and protect them? In effect, the easiest way is to make all kind of input at a low cost, so artificially to help uh, financial repression and artificially overvalue Chinese currencies and also give monopoly to those kind of sectors. That was the way to protect, to subsidize those kind of advanced sectors. And as a result, first, there was some kind of misallocation of resources. China did not have comparable advantages in the capital intensive sectors, but China mobilized all the resources to put into those kind of sectors that China did not have comparable advantages. 
And uh, sectors which China supposed to have competitive advantages, like labor intensive sectors, they could not get any sub resources. So you have misallocation of resources. And also those kind of distortions causing all kind of rent and rent seeking. And so not only you have misallocation of resources, you also have corruption and all those kind of issues as a result. Even with those kind of development strategy, China was able to test nuclear bombs in the 1960s to launch the satellite in the 1970s, but the efficiency was so low. As a result, China remained poor. Only after 1979, the liberalization, China started to develop the sectors which China had competitive advantages. That was light manufacturing sectors. They used a lot of labor, and China's labor cost was low, and so they could be competitive. And with competitive, you know, they started to have a large domestic market and international market. They made a lot of profit, China accumulated capitals, and after capital accumulation, China certainly needed to upgrade the industry, and in the process of industry upgrading, China can benefit from the advantage of backwardness. So my answer to the second question is also very simple. Wrong development strategy. So even you have the potential there, but if you have a wrong strategy, you give up the possibility to use those kind of potentials. Then another puzzle comes. In the 1950s, the post-war periods, all the developing countries actually follow similar strategies. We know that all the socialist countries follow the Stalinist model trying to develop heavy industries. But other developing countries, even in the non-socialist camp, they also adopt similar strategies, try to develop large-scale modern industry after their independence. They get rid of the colonial power. And so they all develop those kind of modern heavy industries. They are very sexy, very modern, but they just cannot function. And they all use all kind of protection subsidies to help those kind of sectors. And as a result, in the 1960s, 1970s, even they could build up certain kind of modern industry, but their economy was very inefficient. So by the time of 1980s, almost all the country started their transition from the government-led growth to a more market-oriented growth and they engage all kind of transition, all kind of reform. But with the same problem, with the same intention to improve the old system, China enjoyed 36 years of stability and dynamic economic growth. China is the only developing country during this period of time did not have systemic crisis. But other transition economy, no matter it's in socialist camp or non-socialist camp, they all encounter something similar, collapse of their economy, stagnation of their economy, and uh, frequently hit by all kind of crisis. You know, we do some kind of maker study and to compare the developing country in the 1960s and the 70s with the developing country in the 1980s and 1990s. And we find that average annual growth rate in the 1980s, 1990s actually was lower than the average annual growth rate of 1960s, 1970s, before the re reform. And the frequency of the crisis in the developing world, including socialists and non-socialists, actually increased instead of reduced. And how come that China enjoys such a, a dramatic transformation? It's a miracle in human history. And how come other countries, their performance deteriorated so much? Again, related to the strategy. Because other countries, during the transition, they follow the Washington, cons Washington Consensus. And uh, what is the idea of Washington Consensus? Because in the 1980s, the observation is that all the developing countries, no matter socialist or non-socialist, they had too many government interventions. And uh, so at that time, the diagnosis was that, how come the developing country cannot perform as well as the high-income country because they have too many interventions. They don't have well-functioning market institutions. 
So in the 1980s, 1990s, the recommendation to the developing country was to follow Washington consensus to establish well-functioning market institution. And if you want to have a well-functioning market institution, you need to privatize the state-owned sectors. You need to marketize the price signals, allow market competition to determine the prices, allow market competition to allocate resources, and you need to liberalize your economy so you can utilize your domestic market and international market, domestic resources and international resources. All those reform programs look individually all very desirable. But when the country adopt those kind of Washington consensus and otherwise the time was to implement all those reforms in one stride, the so-called shock therapy. But after the shock, most country collapsed, stagnant, and a crisis with it frequently. How come? It was because of those distortion and those kind of protections were there for some purpose, right? Were there to protect the older priority sectors, which are very capital intensive. And if you remove all those protection and subsidies, what would be the result? Those kind of sectors would go bankrupt. But they employ a lot of workers, and most of them are in the cities. And uh, if you allow them to really go bankrupt, what would be the situation? Social instability, political instability. And without social stability, political stability, you could not grow your economy. Not only so, those kind of sectors are, come, are perceived as the advanced sectors. And many of them related to national security, the national defense. If you allow those kind of sectors to go bankrupt, you are not going to have national security. Right? Just like in Russia today, in terms of economic size and in terms of per capita GDP, Russia is a middle income country. But how come Russia can? so strong and stand against the pressure of European country or the US. Because Russia still has a very strong military power. Those of military industry are all in the heavy industry sectors. So as a result, even the socialist country and other developing country in the 1980s, 1990s, follow the advice from Washington, IMF, World Bank, they implement the so-called Washington Consensus Reform, but for the concern of social stability and the national securities. After they implemented the Washington Consensus Package of Reform, and they tried to remove the distortion and subsidies, but in the front door, they remove those protection and subsidies. In the back door, they reintroduce other disguised protection and subsidies. And these guys' protection and subsidies actually were less efficient than the old protection and subsidies. And as a result, certainly their economic performance were even worse than they used to be. For example, all the big state-owned enterprises in Russia has been privatized. But they are in the defense sectors. Russia could not have allowed them to really go bankrupt. But they are in sectors without protection and subsidies, they cannot survive. And now after the privatization, actually the private owners will have a higher incentive to argue for protection and subsidy than under the state ownership. Because under state ownership, those managers are state employees. They will go to the government and say, without protection and subsidy, I cannot survive. So you need to give me some protection and subsidies. But after they get a subsidy and protections, at the most they can have luxurious consumption. But they cannot directly pocket those kind of money into themselves because there will be a corruption, right? But after the privatization, those kind of private owners will not subsidize the state. They will use the same excuse to ask for protection and subsidies. And but after the private ownership, the more they get from the state, the more they, will, they can benefit themselves, right? They can put their bank accounts and so on. So they will have a higher incentive to lobby for protection and subsidy. And that's exactly what the situation 
in Russia, in many Eastern European country, and in Latin America country, and other developing country. So after the privatization, the subsidy to those kind of old sector actually increase. So less efficient. And how can China can maintain stability and dynamic economic growth? The main reason is because Chinese people are very pragmatic. With the understanding, without subsidy and protection to all sectors, they cannot survive. So why not? To provide them some kind of transitory protection and subsidy continuously. And then demobilize the entry to the new sector, which are consistent with China's comparative advantages. The labor intensive, light manufacturing sectors. And not only demobilize the entry to those kind of sectors, actively facilitating the growth of those kind of sectors to have the investment promotion, to set up industrial park special economic zone within the industrial park special economic zone to make the infrastructure good enough, business environment good enough, and actively invite Hong Kong manufacturer, Taiwan manufacturer to relocate their production to China, to mainland. And as a result, China maintains stability and dynamic economic growth simultaneously. And with the dynamic economic growth, capital it's accumulated. And so many old sectors in the past, they went against China's comparative advantage because China was a capital scarce economy. But with the rapid economic growth, capital has been accumulated. Gradually, some of those kind of sectors become consistent with China's comparative advantages. And with that, China can remove the protection and subsidies to those kind of sectors. So that's the way that China complete the transition from the planned economy to a market economy from a government debt growth economy to now more market-oriented economy. And then, well, this seemed to be so good. Any prices? A lot of prices. The main prices is income disparity. The main prices is corruption. Why? Because the needs to protect the auto sectors and those kind of protection and subsidies require the government to retain certain distortion in the economic system in order to allow the older sectors, before they gain their viability, can survive. And certainly China removes many distortions, but China still retains certain distortion, for example, in the financial sectors. Currently, the financial sector is dominated by big banks and the equity markets. But so far, currently in, in China, we know that big bank and equity market can only serve big companies, right? But so far, up to now, even up to now, 60% of production, 70% of the employment in China are still in agricultural household micro, small, or medium-sized enterprises in the manufacturing sectors or in the service sectors. And this kind of big bank dominated or equity market dominated the financial system could not provide financial services to them. But how come China adopt this kind of financial system? Because, as I said, at the beginning of the transition, China had a lot of very capital intensive state owned enterprises. Without subsidies in the capital cost to them, without the capital services, they cannot survive. And they are big companies. And so the only way to serve the big companies is the big banks and, uh, and also equity markets. At the beginning, only state owned enterprises are large. But with 30 years of dynamic growth, many private enterprises also become large. They can also uh, get financial services from big bank and uh, big uh, uh, equity markets. And so you can see, only those big ones can get the services. The other small one would not get a service. And not only the big one get the services, they are subsidized. China is still a developing country. Capital costs should be high. But the capital cost in China actually, compared to other developing countries, is quite low. That means what? Whoever gets the financial services, not only get the services, 
they also get subsidies. Who subsidizes them? Lots of people put the money into the financial sheets that could not get financial services. And those are relatively poor people in the agricultural households, well, owner of the, 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 the micro, small, or the medium-sized enterprises. They are poorer, and they are asked to subsidize the rich guys, the big guys. And certainly that will cause the income disparity, right? And also, to get the financial services, that means you can get rent, right? You can get the subsidies. And then you are going to have some kind of rent seeking. Rent seeking is a neutral term created by economists. And use another term people understand is to have bribe and also to have a corruption, right? So that's the reason why the income disparity and the corruption in China has been so prominent in the process. And a similar situation not only in the financial sectors, in the natural resources sectors. Before the transition, all the natural resources are owned by the state. And uh, only state-owned mining companies are there. And, and at that time, to subsidize the large enterprises, capital intensive state-owned enterprises, their output prices were extremely low. And to compensate that, you know, the concession right for mining is almost zero. Okay, after 1983, there are some reform. First, allow the private sector to do mining. At that time, there was not much problem. But after 1993, the upper price were liberalized, linked to the international prices. But the cost and tax for mining is still maintained at a very low level. So whoever get the mining right, whoever immediately can be rich people. And that causes some kind of income disparity, but also contribute to the widespread corruption and so on in China. And similarly, monopoly. To protect some capital intensive you know, industry like telecommunication and so on, they maintain monopoly right. And so they have monopoly rent. And it causes not only the income distribution, but also private sectors will bribe the government in order to get into those kind of monopoly, monopoly sectors. So all those things related to the remaining the legacy of this kind of dual track, gradual transition, it contributes to the stability and dynamic economic growth, but it also causing income disparity and corruption. And, and certainly that has some kind of social political cost. And as a way to really address the income disparity issue as well as corruption issue is to remove the remaining distortion it's a legacy of this kind of gradual and dual track reform. And I think it's not only a necessity politically and socially. It's feasible now. As I mentioned, the reason why to retain those kind of protection and subsidy was because in the 1980s, 1990s, China was a poor country. And the capital advanced sectors was not China's advantages. But now, China is a up to middle income country. Last year, the per income in China was 7,600. And so many of those kind of sectors used to be against the China's competitive advantage. Now are consistent with China's competitive advantages. In the past, to subsidize them is a necessity. Otherwise, they cannot survive. But today, a protection to them is a transfer of income. It causing political cost and uh, social discontent, but it's not necessary things to them for their survival. And so I think it's time to remove those kind of distortion. And that was exactly the spirit of the deepening market-oriented reform adopted by the third plan in 2013 to remove regimental distortion allow market to decide the prices, allow market to allocate resources. And so if those kind of reform program are implemented, I think China will be a well-functioning market economy. And uh, the root cause of the disparity, the root cause of the corruption 
will be eliminated or mitigated. And now the issue is that <coughs> if China implement all the necessary reform, how long that China can maintain those kind of dynamic economic growth? And this become a hot topic now. Because from 2010, the growth rate in China has been decelerating for 60 years already. And then you know the last quarter, the third quarter of this year, the growth rate in China is 6.9%. And it was the first time for China to have such an extended period of deceleration in its growth. In the past, if you have slowdown in the economy, then after one or two years, the growth rate will pick up. But this time, continually for six years. And it caused all kinds of concern because in the past 10 years, China was the major driver of the global growth. China contributed to about 30% or more growth every year in the past 10 years. And uh, certainly, you know that global economy is still very sluggish. And, and if China you know, lose steam, then it will put a pressure on the global economy. And for China, it's also very important. There are some political reasons and also economic reasons. Political reason is that in the 18th Party Congress, China set a target to double per capita GDP, to double GDP uh, by the time of 2020 on the basis of 2010 and also to double the household income by the time of 2020 on the basis of 2010. And, uh, and we know that if we wanted to double the per capita income in 10 years, and double GDP in 10 years, then the average annual growth rate need to be 7.2%. And but in the past few years, the growth rate in China was higher than 7.2%. But in a certain five-year plan period, to double the GDP, the minimum growth rate for China should be 6.5%. And now 6.9% then continue downward pressure. So people was worried that China may not be able to really achieve 6.5% in the coming five years. Not only so, China also wanted to double household income. Now, the population growth rate in China is about 0.5%. So if you wanted to double the household income, you need to plus 6.5 plus 0.5, so around 7%. And, and so it's a political commitment. If China cannot deliver that, that will be considered as a failure. That's one thing. And secondly, also related to real needs, because if China continues to have a deceleration, then unemployment can be an issue. At the same time, Chinese firms rely on bank loans for investment, right? So if you have a lot of firms underperforming, then some of them go bankrupt, then non-performing loans may all of a sudden increase rapidly. And number three, the social political stability. We know that in the past 30 years, you always have the coming collapse of the Chinese economy. And uh, so many people think uh, this is uh, evidence for the coming collapse of the Chinese economy. But whether this indicating the Chinese economy is going to collapse or not, depends on two things. One, what is the potential growth rate in China? And the second one, to understand what is the reason for the deceleration of the growth in the past six years? For the potential growth rate, I argue China should have the potential to grow at 8% for another 20 years from 2008, or alternatively, for another about 15 years to come. And how come I take that position? It related to my talk at the beginning the advantage of back one is. Even after 36 years of very dynamic economic growth, actually, China still have a huge advantage of back one is. How to measure the advantage of back one is? I think the best way 
is to look into the difference in per capita GDP between China and high income country, for example, the US. Because per capita GDP means average labor productivity. Average labor productivity means the average level of technology and value added of your industries. And the newest data I could have is the data for 2008 for international comparison. In 2008, the per capita GDP in China was 21% of the US, measured by purchasing power parity. It was similar to Japan in 1951, Singapore in 1967, Taiwan, China in 1975, and Korea in 1977. These East Asian economies are among those 13 economies I mentioned. And then based on per capita GDP of 21% of US, this East Asian economy grew at 8 to 9% for 20 years. If tap into the same mechanism, they could realize the growth of 8 to 9% for 20 years. That means there's a potential for China to grow around 8% for 20 years. That's my estimation. And uh, 2008 to now seven years, right? At least we have another 13 years in, to come for China to grow at average or 8%. There's a potential for that. But if uh, there's a potential for 8% growth, how come since 2010 it continued to drop and now to 60 6.9%. Well, if you have a potential, whether you can realize the potential depends on what? Depends on your external condition and internal condition. And also, when we talk about the growth potential, we look into the supply side. But if we want to look into the annual, product, annual growth rate, we also need to look into the demand side. And the demand side, we know that there are three drivers of growth, export, investment, and consumption. And the export I mentioned, for the past 36 years, China's export increased very rapidly. The trade growth rate was 16.3%. Export growth rate was 16.8% per year in the past 36 years. But because high-income country has now fully recovered from the 2008 financial crisis. So the high income country, they grew very sluggish. As a result, the export to high income country decelerated a lot. For example, the first three quarters this year, the export growth rate was negative 2.1%. Certainly, that put a downward pressure for China's realization of its growth potential. Secondly, investment. In 2008, after the shock of the global crisis, every country adopted certain counter-cyclical intervention to support investment in order to create jobs, right? But after six years, those kind of projects completed. But global economy has not recovered yet. So under this kind of situation, unless you have a new stimulus project, Otherwise, investment growth will also drop. And this is a situation not only partic particular to China, right? All the emerging market, all the export-oriented, high-income economy face the similar situation. And the only driver now remains consumption. Luckily, because employment in China is still quite high. Not hurt yet. And household income continues to grow, and so consumption continues to grow at 8%, around 8%. That was the reason why China in the past few years was able to maintain 7% or more growth. But other emerging market economies like Brazil or India or other export-oriented high-income economies like Singapore, Taiwan, and Korea, they all have a similar pattern of deceleration and in effect because their consumption cannot grow as rapid as China. Their deceleration was even sharper than China. So many people get pessimistic about China because they thought 
the deceleration was due to the internal structural problem or development models problem. As a transition economy, as a developing country, certainly China has many problems in those areas. However, the deceleration was mainly caused by external and cyclical factors. Then coming forward, I don't have confidence for the high income country to have a full recovery. So export market is likely to be quite sluggish in the year to come. And so China's growth will have to rely more on the internal demand. But internal demand has two components. One is investment, the other one is consumption. And I'm sure you hear a lot about the need for China to, to transform from investment that grows to consumption that grows. Here I like to say, it's a recipe for crisis. If China really follows that kind of advice, it's a recipe for crisis. Why? Consumption certainly is very important. But consumption growth need to based on income growth, right? If income does not increase, you increase your consumption, then you are going to be indebted very quickly. Then crisis will come, right? And how can we have income growth? Well, you need to increase labor productivity, right? And if you want to increase your labor productivities, you need to have technological innovation, industrial upgrading, all require investment. And uh, not only you need to improve your labor productivity, you need to reduce your transaction cost, right? In order to realize the value, right? How can you re reduce transaction cost? You need to improve the bottleneck of infrastructure. Again, that requires investment. So the issue is not to transform from investment that grows. The issue is to ask whether China, after 36 years of very high rate of investment, whether China still have good investment opportunity or not. If China have good investment opportunity, maintain investment growth rate, then it will create job, create income to the household, and the household will continue to increase its income, increase its consumption growth, and then China will be able to maintain reasonably high growth rate, right? So the question is whether after 36 years of investment that grows, does China still have good investment opportunity? My answer is definitely yes. Because China is a middle-income country. Even today, many people talk about the excess capacity in China. Most of them are in construction sectors, low value added sectors. China can continue to invest to upgrade the industry, right? A lot of opportunity. Secondly, infrastructure. China, in the past, invested a lot in the infrastructure to connect one city to the other city. Highway, high-speed train, airport facility, port facility. But in no city, infrastructure is very poor. And so those are the areas for good investment. Environment protection, Again, need investment. Urbanization, currently the urbanization rate in China is 54% of the population. High income country, they all reach 80% or more. So China still have many, many good investment opportunity. And I'd like to mention, this is something make China different from other high income country. Other high income country, after the crisis, they need to maintain growth but they don't have good investment opportunity because their industry are on the global frontier. Even you have one or two new industries, but like 3D, the electronic vehicles, they are not large enough to pull the economy out of the recession. And their infrastructure is good, maybe old, but refreshment of the oil infrastructure return is not as high as new investment to remove the bottleneck and their environment is good, and they already reached the height of their urbanization. So high-income country, it's very hard to find good investment opportunity. China is a developing country, still have many good investment opportunities, the one thing. But if you want to make investment, you also need to have resources, right? China still have very good resources. Fiscal debt, government debt, both central and local, combined is only 56% of the GDP. US, 
120%, Japan, 250%, most developing country, more than 100%. So the Chinese government is in a relatively good position to continue to use fiscal stimulus. So, and also monetary policy. Interest rate and reserve ratio in China are extremely high. So there's room for the monetary policy also. In addition to that, private savings in China is about 50% of GDP. So the government can use its investment to leverage private sector investment. And uh, if you want to make investment, you need to import raw material, equipment, you need to have foreign reserve. Even after the talk about capital flight, China still have 3.5 trillion of US dollars. And these three conditions make China differ from other developing countries. Other developing countries, they also have good investment opportunity, but they are often constrained by the poor fiscal position, low household shaving, or inadequate foreign reserve. China are not limited, limited by those. So I think that with this good investment opportunity and uh, resources for investment, China should be able to maintain 6.5% to 7% growth with 8% growth potential. And China, even external condition is not good, but utilize the internal condition, China will be able to achieve 6.5 to 7% growth rate in the coming at least five years. And that means that the target of the 18th Party Congress can be achieved. And China, even with 6.5% growth, China will contribute to about 1% of growth in the world. Currently, the global growth is about 3% to 3.5%. So China will continue to contribute 30% of the global growth. China will continue to the driver of the growth, global growth in the year to come. Thank you very much.